um, what actually has been happening in case we missed some plot points that will be important to kind of understanding the ending of this book. Because the next time you're going to be uh, finishing this one, there's not that much left. Did anyone read ahead and finish it? Oh, no, you're like, oh, I have enough to do. <laughs> um, so, What I want to go through some plot points. Yeah. So there's one thing that we didn't talk about, which is what Vardaman does to the coffin. Um, let's, let's actually start from the beginning. So Addie is dying, right? She's laying in her bed. She's listening to Cash make a coffin outside of her room. Um, and all of the kids are thinking about that. They're kind of thinking about whether or not that is good for her, whether or not that's good for them. Um, kind of like they're speculating on what's going through her mind at that moment, right? Dewey Dell is pregnant. We get that information. Um, she's pregnant with Leif's baby. She doesn't want to keep the baby. And so she's kind of like, uh, she has this, this weird feeling of like, I kind of want mom to die so I can go into the city and take care of this type of idea. Um, and then Addie dies. Uh, and everybody has their reactions, and that's what we talked about last time, right? Everyone seems to spiral into this existential crisis, and they're like, well, what, if, if there is such thing as death and my mom can die, then what am I, right? And we get that from Vardaman and Darl and Dewey Dell, and Darl assures us that Jewel is not going through this. Cash seems to have been, like, sort of preparing for it ahead of time through this process of making the coffin. He seems like this very kind of logical, practical guy. Um, you read The Home Burial by Robert Frost, right? Yeah. He kind of reminds me of the man, the husband in Home oh, Burial. He does. Which is just like try and do stuff with your hands to like distract yourself from the grief a little bit it's or like... Yeah, and if you can do something, then maybe you don't have to, you can think about that idea rather than the kind of fact that your mom is dying, right? Um, anyway, so so Cash, is, Cash kind of goes through his experience that way. Ants keeps referring to getting teeth now. He's like, I, I picture him just like, um, I picture him with like three teeth, you know, in his mouth. Like he's he's been, <laughs> he's been having a hard time with dental care for a while now. And now that Addie's dead, he's going to get some teeth. Um, and what I, what I get into that over and over again is sort of like, I can meet new people, you know? I can, I can maybe find a new life now that Addie is passing away. So there's not much grief on Ants' part. The one thing that Ants, though, is adamant about is fulfilling his promise to Addie, which is taking her to her people to be buried. Um, and Cora and Toll, especially Cora, has a real problem with this, right? Like, she's just like, I think Samson talks about it too. So all the, all the community members are like, why doesn't Addie just want to be buried with her husband? It's proper to be buried with your husband and your husband's family. Why is she want to, why does she want to go back to like her people? That seems disrespectful. It seems like almost like a divorce after death, right? But Ants keeps saying, I'm not going to begrudge her this. I'm going to fulfill my promise. So no matter what we think about Ants being lazy or manipulative, um, he is going to be loyal to that, that promise. You know, that kind of seems like his, his way of, of grieving is following the steps to being like loyal. Okay, um, so she dies and then there is this scene that we didn't talk about where Vardaman runs to Toll's house and Toll and Cora have this drenched little boy in their house who's kind of freaking out about a fish being dead. Um, do you, did you get what happened in that scene? What did Vardaman do to the coffin? Yeah. Didn't he like, like drill holes in the mom's face because he was trying to break through the coffin or something? Yeah, he's trying to drill air holes, right? Because he's kind of like obsessed in that section. Like she can't breathe. She can't breathe. So oh, it reminds me. Have you guys seen that movie, My Girl? The rest of you have it. Like it's like she, he can't see without his glasses. It's like that kind of moment, which was the saddest moment of my childhood watching that movie. Like you guys should see that movie. That one is like. The most, I still can't watch it without sobbing, like uncontrollable <laughs> sobbing. And I don't know if that's because I'm remembering what it was like to watch it as a kid, or if I am just, it is just that sad of a movie, but it's horrible, um, but very good. Anyway, so he, he is trying to give her air holes to breathe. Um, and it says a little bit later, again, in Toll's section, that he had, when he takes the, the 
kind of the chisel and is going through, uh, he hits her face a couple times. So she has these holes in her face now, in the body's face. And uh, so they put a veil over her. They create a mosquito net veil to try and cover it up. And then there's a scene where Cash is trying to like carefully fill in those holes because the coffin was perfect, right? And he wants to keep that perfect. Um, so he's like trying to, to mask it. And other people are like, you could have just like hammered a tin can over it and you would have been fine, right? But no, he's gonna like fill in the holes perfectly to try and try and like, it's his way of fulfilling a kind of promise to her, you know? Okay, so that, that's one part that some people um, get a little lost on is that air holes part. Did you, did you catch it? It's really small in there. Okay. Um, then they go to, they're, they're traveling. They stop for the night at Samson's house. This is where Jewel is like, you uh, give me, uh, can you give me some hay? Can you sell me some hay? And Samson's like, am I going to sell you food? Just take the food for your horse. And Jewel keeps saying, no, I'm not going to be beholden to anyone. My horse isn't going to be beholden to anyone. Like he's very adamant about this, right? Um, and later on, we find out where he got that horse. Did you, wh wh where does he get the horse? This was Darl's section in the last part that we read. Yeah, Brooklyn. He got it from someone that the guy was like working in the field, yeah, he was basically going all night long secretly to work the field so that he could earn money for himself. Um, this kind of not just for the family, which Anse is really upset about, so that he can buy this horse. And I love that part where Cash and Darrell both think that he is, uh, he's going after a woman. And they're like, she's probably married. This is why he is doing this in secret. You know, she's a married woman. Um, but it turns out, no, all he wanted was this horse, uh, which I think tells us a little bit about Jewel um, and his priorities. You know, he doesn't seem that interested in coming in like a romantic relationship. What he wants is like something of his own to control, the way that he can control that horse. Um, so anyway, they're at Samson's house. They they stay in the barn because they don't want to be beholden to anyone. Um, then they get to the river and they see that the bridge has washed out um, or the water has overflowed and they can't cross the bridge, right? but they're gonna cross the river anyway. And this is where we get those multiple sections describing this river crossing. And it kind of circles around over and over again. And Toll describes it one way, Darl describes it another. Vardaman describes it, although it's hard to even tell what he's describing, you know. Um, Cash has a little bit in there and they all are kind of circling around the same events. I love that part because to me that feels so true to how those events feel in my head. Um, have you ever been in like a, a car crash or something dramatic where it feels like things are both speeding up and slowed down simultaneously? Like it seems like you have no control in the moment and this creates this sped up effect. Like I can't do any reactions because there's no time. And yet at the same time, there's this like, I remember every tiny little bit of this and that kind of stretches out that experience. I had this experience when I was a little kid and my, my friend was, she was pitcher and I was catcher on the softball team. And uh, she, I had turned because there was like a little kid walking behind, right behind me. I didn't want him to miss and hit the kid. So I was kind of like telling her to stop, but she had already done her thing. And so I just remember this so clearly. And I was young, I was like 13. I just remember like, the ball coming towards my face. And if it had really been as slow as it felt, I should have been able to catch it, you know, or at least like stopped it from hitting me. But instead it just felt like it was just coming like this and I couldn't do anything and it hit me in the eye. Um, and it was just like the weirdest example of the relativity of time where it really does, time really does depend on our perception of it, you know? Um, I think that river scene kind of gives us that feeling of it looping over and over again. It becomes so slow. But what really happens is they're crossing the river and these logs are from, that have been washed from, you know, shore up, upstream are kind of like catapulting towards them because of the strength of the river, right? And one of these logs hits into the wagon and it breaks Cash's leg and Addie goes flying downstream. The coffin goes flying downstream, right? The wagon is flipped over. Um, the horses and the mules are all in danger. Like it's just this chaotic moment. Um, then they, they get out of the water and they try and deal with Cash's broken leg. 
and try and find his tools because that's what he's he's kind of interested in. He's like, I spent so much time and effort getting these tools. I gotta hi Elios. I gotta I gotta find these things. So they all go out and they're like holding onto the rope and getting the tools. And that part is quite long too, which I love that part. Like they they're working together as a family in that section. I think. Um, okay, and then we get this strange section about where Addie makes a, a revelation, speaking from the grave. It seems. Um, it's either cutting back in time to right before she died, and so we have this non-linear structure, or somehow we are getting a voice from beyond the grave. But what does she reveal in that section that's so important? About Jewel. Yeah, Angelina. Yes, Jewel is whose son then? Did you catch this one? Whitfield, the reverend. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Jewel is the reverend's son, which explains a few things at this point. It explains her special relationship to Jewel. The fact that when he was working in the fields and he was so sleepy, she was like so concerned with it, so much so that she's willing to get Dewey Dell to do his work for him, you know, like she's really concerned with Jewel. Um, it kind of explains the relationship Jewel feels like he has with his mom, where he understands her a little bit better, um, that he at least has a different relationship to her than the other family members. Uh, it also, to me, kind of starts to explain why Darl is so obsessed with Jewel. Like, he seems to just be always, every time it has a Darl sense, just like, and Jewel's doing this, and Jewel's doing that, and like, why is Jewel this way, you know? I think about this stuff, but Jewel doesn't. It almost seems like Darl either knows or intuits that Jewel is different, is made up of different stuff than he is. Um, and then did you catch, like, Dewey Dell and Vardman are Anse's children. It's almost like she's like, sorry for Jewel, I'll just, we'll have two more kids to make up for it. <laughs> she kind of put it that way, you know? Um, so that part's really important to get that, that, the, that Jewel is an illegitimate son um, from, with the Reverend. Um, and I think that catches us up on, on plot. Is there anything else in the plot that was confusing that we need to... Dewey Dell hasn't made it into town yet, right? She has? Okay, so we had that scene. Sorry, I'm... We have that scene with uh, her in the pharmacy then? Yeah. What's she trying to do in the pharmacy? She's got money, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the Amstead section, right? She's got money and she's trying to buy uh, basically pills for an abortion. So she, she's trying to get whatever they had in 1930. I have not actually done the uh, research on what that actually is, but she's trying to get some form of, of uh, an abortion here. Um, and the clerk tells her to come back later, right? Okay. So um, that. When you told me to get lost? To get lost. Okay. That part will become a little bit clearer later. I don't want to spoil anything, so I'm going to stop there because I didn't read from, I didn't read Mosley on, on down. So I'm sorry I keep getting behind with you guys. It's a bad form. Um, I've read the book, though, I swear. <laughs> okay, anyway, does that kind of clear up anything about Addie? Does it clear up? What other questions do you have about plot? Yeah, Emberly. Oh, uh, what was up with the concrete? Uh, that was the last thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's horrible. So Cash has a broken leg, and they're trying to drive him in the wagon, right? And it's bumping around because it's a wagon, so it's causing him a lot of pain. So they decide, oh, it makes a lot of sense then to encase your leg in concrete so that it kind of doesn't move around as much and cause you as much pain. So they're basically pouring concrete over his broken leg as a kind of cast. Mm -hmm. It's horrible. Just wait till the concrete comes off. It's even worse. Oh. <laughs> Is there any other any other bits that were confusing? Okay, awesome. Um, okay, so with that, I want to focus on the river sections today. Next time, we're going to spend the whole time on Addie's section. Addie's section is um, quite like linguistically complex really complex um, and she's talking about a lot of big ideas in a similar way to Darl when he's talking about big ideas so I want to spend a whole class on that but before we get to that I want to talk about this idea that time is circling with this river these river sections 
Oh, thank you. Hey, so I like to do this with different pieces of music. I, I kind of want to inspire in us what Varnaman somewhat feels in that shed, where he can hear wood and he can smell the horse. Um, that's normal, but he can see hearing coiling towards the horse. I want to recreate a little bit by combining our senses um, where we're going to do some close reading exercises, but for each person in the river, we are going to listen to a different piece of music. These pieces of music, except for one that I just decided sounded like, sounded like water. Um, but these different pieces of music are mostly inspired by water. So let me get set up here. So don't start on this yet. I'll explain it here in a second. First one we're going to look at is Toll. This is how Toll describes the water. He does it quite a lot in, I think he has two sections about the river. Um, he talks about the water a lot, but this is the first thing. Actually, this isn't the very first thing, but this is one thing that I think is significant that Toll says. So you're going to look at the passage and you're going to annotate it. Let me show you what mine looks like. So I want you to really try and get into the language where you're like circling things, you're underlining things, you're thinking about definitions, you know, you're really trying to like pick out what he is saying in this section of what might be the significance of it. So it's almost like we do with poetry, right? Um, this book reminds me a whole lot about poetry, which is why I do it after our poetry unit. Um, you're, you're trying to look at every word choice as significant, even if Faulkner was drunk and just doing it in a flurry. Um, he, to me, each word in the thing is important. So then you're going to answer these two questions. What are Toll's main concerns? And what do Toll's language choices tell us about his relationship to the land? So as you're listening to the music, you're annotating and answering just the two questions for Toll. All right. So this first piece of music is Mendelssohn. Here we go. Here we go. Yeah.
Still working on toll section, not moving forward. By now you should try and answer a couple of those questions if you can. questions you want to go back and see if you can discover more in the text. Okay, did you get a chance to finish the questions? Raise your hand if you need more time. Okay, we're gonna move on then, you're good where you are. Yeah. Okay. All right, tell me about Toll's perspective here of the river. Um, let's start just with this first question. What seems to be, and I'm gonna stay back here just so that I don't need to move around too much with the Zoom call. Um, what seems to be his main concerns? Sam? I don't think like he's really fascinated, not only the fact that 
obviously the river is you know kind of taking the wagon away, right? But this idea that it's almost like this threatening and ever changing force, like almost attaches sentience and yeah. malice to the river. I agree. So I see that in the way the place where he says waiting in the threat. Like there's this intention here. I like the word malice there, that it seems to be like um somehow set up against humans and wants to do everything in its power to take out the human, right? Is there anywhere else where you guys found intention? And I, I'm going to make uh, other people besides Sam find the intentions here too. Anywhere else that you find intention in the water, like where it seems to be sentient or it seems to be an active force making choices. Yeah. I think just also the biblical description of it, like all the fish like rush out of him to like a kind of river. Mm -hmm. It um when you think of like something that's cold or um, dangerous, like it kinda or when you think of something cold, um, especially like a river that makes you think of like rapids more. Mm -hmm. And it's like just really um how he describes it very like costly and like it's unfamiliar, like he doesn't know what it's gonna be. I like that. So it's like the kind of lived, right? So it's not that he's totally sure about its intentions. It just seems to have it. So he's not like, he's not, um, he's terrified of the unknown here, I think. Yeah. And do you see how it says the earth hid except for the tongue of it? That also seems to imply malice to me. Like it's almost like not just the water is against them, but the earth as well by hiding itself away from them and not allowing them to like see the clear division between land and water anymore. Okay, the other thing about his property that, that Sam mentioned there is like clearly he's like concerned about the wagon too, right? Because here at the end he says, with us setting in the wagon and on the horse and the mule. I find it so fascinating there that he divides up the horse and the mule and the wagon. He's like, these are three different things. It's not just us here, it is these three different things. He seems concerned with property lines. Um, if the, if his, if this idea of the threat is coming from the fact that he can't tell what is active and what is not, what has intentions and what doesn't, and what is the earth and what is the water, then this disruption of divisions between things seems very disturbing to him. He says, the earth hid except for the tongue of it. We was going on out to the bridge. There's lack of division there in the sentence too. There should be a period there, right? But instead, he has shown the way that it all flows together. And I think for Toll, that's a disturbing idea because later on in that paragraph, he makes sure that he divides it and says, there's a wagon, there's a horse and a mule. Um, the horse is Jules, the mule is his. And I think it's important that he maintains that distinction even when the natural world is not supporting him in that effort. Okay, tell me about what it tells us then about his relationship to the land. Yeah, Brooklyn. Um, Mm -hmm. like, like, it very, like it was just a tangle of yellow and um, and he says like it was just water. Mm. Um, that kind of shows that like normally um, he probably notices it more now because he's in a different situation. But normally he um, it kind of diffuses like nature and stuff that is just in the background and something to be. Um, like built over, like how he says he can only recognize where there's a truck because it's, he could see where the bridge used to be. Mm -hmm. And so he's kind of holding on to the distance of like man made objects and just um, seeing like the natural world is just like. Yeah, good. So it's the it's humans are elevated above the natural world and humans need to maintain that place above um, just nature. I like that a lot. Yeah, I'm really. He seems very familiar with the land, like he kind of was like that country folk, just like all the time out in Oregon. Mm -hmm. He kind of reminds me of my grandpa, how he's like, like he comes like these natural problems and then like puts them with man-made type things, but he's still very close to the actual problem. Yeah. He's got like very healthy respect for the danger. He's yes. Not just like, oh wow, it's a river, we'll be fine. He's right. Like, no, this could like. 
Yes, exactly. Like, I think that if I had walked up on it, I'd be like, whoa, river, crazy, you know, and not really been able to understand the dangers of it. Um, and he tries to tame it in his own ways, but then has this healthy respect. I really like that. This passage does pit nature versus human. Um, and he kind of sees it as this kind of battle. And the stakes of the battle are not just crossing the river, right? The stakes of the battle are maintaining his sort of like humanity in the face of the natural world too. Okay, now we're gonna do Darl's section. Um, and it goes the same way. If you turn the page, um, it is the same questions. So, but a different piece of music this time to kind of inspire us. I thought the Mendelssohn has a, well, exactly what Emberly said. I thought the Mendelssohn had this healthy respect for nature. Sometimes it's beautiful. Sometimes it's overwhelming. Sometimes uh, it has that kind of malice in it. This next one is Tchaikovsky's Intro to the Tempest. So let's see, Tchaikovsky. That's not a name anyone should have to spell. All right, here we go.
stop there. Okay, so Jarl's section um, has a whole lot of similes and metaphors. Um, it uses similar images to toll, like he talks about yellow, the water being yellow twice again, but it has this different effect. So what would you say Darl's main concern is in this section? What is his, his purpose here? Or what does he want to achieve? Hmm. 
<laughs> what did you write for the first one? It's okay if you feel like you got it wrong. <laughs> yeah, Sam. Um, so I thought that you think it would be more interesting with the properties of the wagon, I'm sorry, the river, as opposed to the welfare of the wagon. Yeah. Like he really only mentions the wagon in relation to the river, like not just on its own, this is what I can transform. Right. Yeah. He doesn't seem to be concerned for the wagon and he also doesn't seem to be concerned for the humans either. Like it is just the, like you said, the properties of the river that he seems to be most concerned with um, and describing the properties of the river in these minute details. Right. Um, I, I agree with that. What else did you write in your, what he's concerned with section? Yeah, Brooklyn. I think he's still kind of stuck on these existential questions. Okay. Like he keeps still raising, um, like not specifically bringing up the questions, but like the way he describes the water as like something that is not like it's like countless. So it's just like flowing and flowing, but it's also like impermanent. And he's just like kind of transfixed by this idea yeah. that it maybe could represent like good and evil. Yeah, this idea of impermanence seems to be vastly important to Darl, right? He seems to be obsessed with transitions. Um, in his, when he was thinking about himself and the is and the was, he was thinking about what's the transition like between wake and sleep? And when am I alive? And when am I not? And how can I still be alive if I'm not? You know, and he's like, very interested in these transitionary spaces and describing them, right? This river gives him a chance to explore transitions even more because a river is, what is that phrase? You never step in the same river twice, right? Um, it's, that's an ancient uh, Greek idea that because the river is always in motion, it is never the same river. Right? Um, other people would say, no, just because it's changing, just because it has different properties as it goes, it all is encompassed by the same river. It's all of the, the river, right? This is the, the Mississippi River. So it's never going to be, even if it has different things to it, it's still this complete whole. Vardaman might think about it that way. Um, you know, even though it has these different parts and I can separate the different parts into the different parts, <laughs> it is still the river. And you might think of that as a whole or uh, as an illusion, an, illusor, uh, an illusory, is that a word? Um, whole, but it is still a whole, right? Whereas Darrell here is talking about how it is ceaseless and yet it is myriad, and this seems to cause him some kind of, again, anxiety. And I love how he says it's somehow profoundly significant, right? There's something profoundly significant going on here. Um, but, and yet the impermanence of it, even though it creates the significance, it also creates an opportunity for him to like not fully understand what the river is. So what is he doing here to try to understand what the river is? If we were to think of Darrell as like working through, if we're to think of this as a representation of thought patterns, right? The same way that stream of consciousness is supposed to be this representation of thought on the page. How is he going, why is he going through all of these thoughts to try and understand the river? What is his, what is his uh, project here we could say? Why do we, I mean, yeah, Brooklyn, go ahead. Kind of trying to find like, um, like you said, like his own thought patterns and the way the river is moving. Like, um, not necessarily that maybe the river wonders about like, existential, like or has an existential crisis, but like, um, because he he's trying to make it more human and more relatable. Yeah. By saying like, um, like he's describing like his voice and how it's like mournful. Yes. So Toll also seemed to ascribe human qualities. What is that, by the way, what is that a uh, literary term called? Personification, yeah. Toll also tried to personify the river, right? He saw it as threatening, he saw it as the earth hiding, um, the river kind of lives, etc. Darl in his personification of the river, he personifies it in a different way. In what way is Darl's personification different than Toll's personification? Yeah, Sam. Um, as opposed to just making it seem like a malicious force, uh -huh. he almost catches like a dark friend for the river. Mm, I like that. Something that's, I guess, both desolating, white-filled, uh, mournful, 
but then it's also seed splits in terms of its immensity, um, long strip, and then obviously it's probably significant. Mm -hmm. And just all that. So I think that, you know, as opposed to being just some strange, horrible force, it's something that he has deep respect for and yet is also a favorite. Yes. Um, what I would call, I love that phrase that you, I just wrote it down, the dark grandeur. What I would call that is it's, it's sublime. It impresses him with its immensity. It's almost like he can't comprehend this big, vast, ever-changing thing, right? And because he can't comprehend it, he has a kind of healthy, we talked about whole, Toll having a healthy fear. Um, Toll's fear of it was for his own safety. Darl's fear is in the grandeur itself. He looks at this thing and he's like, I can't fully comprehend this thing. And so I need to have some respect for this thing as something grander than my human processes can fully comprehend. But that doesn't stop him from making the effort to comprehend it. And that's what I really love about this passage. The way that he's carefully describing it, it's like he's trying to pin it down with his language. If I can describe this as a horse with sweat lathering, I can kind of pin down this river and stop it right here and I can pretend that I can fully describe the river, right? And with each description that he says, he's trying to like linguistically fix it. The same way he does with is and was. If you can describe what is is, like you can describe what living is through language, then it seems like you could create a kind of clarity to living that I think if we all really thought about it, there is, there's not a clarity to that. Like, how do you describe consciousness really? How do you describe what it feels like to be conscious? That is very difficult to do, right? But Darl seems to try to do that over and over again by ascribing language to these different experiences, right? So if this river is so big and so threatening and so, or not threatening, but like so ceaseless and myriad and changing and blah, at least through his description, he can pause it for a second and he could say at this moment it was this right but what i like too is that the description kind of contradicts itself in places like it is um where's a good one well i like this one at the end it is immense yet circumscribed um which to me that that's a contradiction in terms right for something to be immense it feels like it is not restricted and yet circumscribed it is restricted and so he's like as the description goes on, it feels like he's trying to describe the river in these different moments, but hoping that by like fixing it at all these different points, he can describe the thing as a whole. Does this make sense at all in my babbling? It kind of makes sense. To me, it feels a lot like what he's doing with his sort of experience of living. Like, and I loved how Brooklyn was like, this is a continuation of his existential crisis. Yeah, he seems to be like projecting what it feels like to be conscious now onto everything that he looks at and like looking at how immense just the world is now, not just the world inside his head, but the world now outside of him too. And now he's just like, what is anything kind of idea? Anyone want to add to this, Darl's, anything else you noticed about Darl's passage? It seems important. Yeah, I'm really good. I'm comparing it to Cole's perspective. Like, Cole seems like he's an experience and stuff. And, like, Darl, like, he must be experienced with nature because he, like, spends all day working on the farm. Yeah. But he approaches problems a lot more like a scholar than, like, hands-on how to fix a person. It's like, he can like fix problems if he understands it. Like he feels like he just understands something, then he'll just solve it. Yes. I absolutely think this is a matter of control. Yeah. And whereas Toll is like something is threatening me. And so the only control I can have is over me as a person and over my property. Darl seems to want to control the experience as a whole, it's control things that he cannot control. You know, it's this kind of obsession that is emerging. Um, and it does seem to be, he, he's like the scholar or the poet of the book, you know, that his project here throughout the book is to try to describe things that are indescribable, like death, like being, and even like this river, like the natural world. Yeah, Ali Rose. Um, I think that's like, I, I think he's like exactly what you want. Like, he's like, he's like the person that's controlling the Yeah. And so I think he's obsessed with tools because um, he sees himself in. Yes. 
I could see that. And yet at the same time, he's like envious of Jewel because he's like, maybe he thinks that Jewel actually does have the control. Even though Jewel couldn't stop his mom dying, it's like, he keeps insisting. You remember when they're like going to get their $3? By the way, the other class did the calculation. That would be $46 today. So they left their mom on her deathbed for today, our $46, which either shows how poor they are or how much they are trying to avoid what is happening in that room, right? Like that is not a lot of money. Anyway, so remember when they're on that trail and Darl keeps like calling after Jewel, like, hey, Addie Bundren's going to die. Addie Bundren's going to die, like insisting on it to him. Oh, we got another person. Oh, she's in a different class. Can I, hang on, sorry. I know this is unprofessional here. I got to tell her. Um, Gaja, we are still in first period. Okay. Um, so, anyway, so like he's, he's insisting, right? And it almost seems like he's like upset that Jewel has that sense of control. Like he's like, you, you don't get to have control when I don't have control. So I need to tell you over and over again that you don't, you know? And I think that kind of does support what Ali Rose is saying about Darl is, sees himself in Jewel, that same desire for control, but it's almost like Darl thinks that Jewel is in control or that Jewel has an assurity that he doesn't. Yeah. Like that one scene where they're leaving the coffin and it ends up at the very end just being him and Jewel leaving it. Yeah. And like Jewel just seems to have like this control almost over just like a law of gravity, like how it just like spins it <laughs> right. into the wagon. And Darl's just like, wow, that's so impressive. And he's <laughs> yeah. just like fixated on this idea. Or probably Jewel's so strong or something, but like he's just like Jewel can just control everything. Like. Yes, yes, that, that's a, a perfect example of it, yeah. Anything else we want to say about Darl's section? Okay, let's move on to Vardaman. I got some jazz for Vardaman here. Um, so this one is not technically about water, but to me it feels waterish. <laughs> so I think it's gonna get, set, a, set the mood for Vardaman here. Writing's not that easy. Can Isn't this a good water song? <laughs> okay, here we go. Thank you. 
close reading process, doesn't it? Like it's so distracting. I, I think that works for Vardaman's section, um, that kind of like frenzy that's going on in your head as you read it. So what is Vardaman's main concerns as he goes into this, this river? <laughs> yeah, Amberly? It's like his um, fish metaphor thing, which mm -hmm. like, he then like calls it added to for this because like the casket, I assume that's what he's talking about when he says the, like, the casket's like floating away down the river and they're yep. always like trying to get it. And yeah, it's Addy like, he's talking about. Yeah, uh -huh. It's just like even more just like my mom is a fish because like they're always trying to catch it in a river. And so he's like concerned about that metaphor, but also just like yeah, just the fact that they're all in need to get it. Okay, good. So if, if Vardaman is understanding the transition between life and death as a trans transformation of his mom into a fish, right? That means that his mom still has a kind of agency here, an ability to act. And so anytime he talks about his mom, it's like she fought. Um, she is kind of choosing to 
fly away from me, right? To swim, I should say, to swim away from me. And it's Darl who's going to like fix her here for me so that she doesn't get away. Okay, good. So it does seem like his main concern here is, uh, is Addie escaping. Like if we're talking about the, this as the river, it's like his main concern with the river is that it gives Addie the chance to escape. Yeah. Okay, tell me a little bit more about his concerns. Yeah, Ali Rose. Well, um, so I've analyzed a ton of words. So I'm just going to type up the Awesome. Okay. So, um, that's Monin. Uh -huh. And it's, it's all about, like, improvising. And it, it, they all improvise at certain parts. And then it goes back into, like, one central voice. And then it improvises. And it's all messy. And it's all bad. And it all goes back. And so I think that's a great representation of Ryland's mind right now. Yes. Because um, everything's going wrong for him. He and like his worst fears are coming alive. And like the thoughts won't start, won't stop happening. And his repetition is like the, the improvising in the songs where everyone's just doing their own thing. And then he's like yelling. Mm setting a point mm -hmm. and then he trails off and then he sets a point. So I think like his concern is that like he's just like his two brothers. He's just like all of his family where they don't have a sense of control mm -hmm. and they just want that sense of control and everything that they wish wasn't happening is happening. Yes. Yes, absolutely. You totally got why I chose that that song for this little section. It's like um, I kind of flipped it though. To me, it felt like the the parts where they all come together and they are playing in harmony. To me, that felt like the repetition part, and the action felt like the improvisation. Improv, improv. Um, it felt like that that repetition that he uses is the only time he feels a kind of control and i don't think it's fully in control right but where he's like he would hold her and it was all right it was all right now it was all right to me that slows down the narrative every time you repeat something it's like a little mini circle inside of these bigger circles of retelling the river story over and over again and that little mini circle is this point where you can relax for a second and kind of stick with one point for a second so it slows things down um i used to, i don't know if you guys if anyone else does this do you ever like listen to one song on repeat when you are trying to study or when you're trying to calm down a little bit um it's this idea that like it's almost like a mantra a kind of hypnotism type idea or like a meditation type idea to reassure yourself over and over again he he's reassuring himself of, as a concept of a concept that it will be all right but through the act of repetition it's a kind of um reassurance just to repeat something to think oh in this moment i can slow down for a second and sit with one thought um anybody else have an idea about about vardaman and what he's doing in this section what's a state of mind like or yeah Brooklyn. something that stood out to me is um well as i was reading there's like no punctuation yes and so like it just felt like i feel i felt like i couldn't read it that slowly yep um, so it shows like this like frantic feeling but then um the thing that did like whenever um he mentions darl most of the time darl is capitalized and so like that for me and especially just because like his name is kind of like a strong word like darl yeah um and so it kind of creates like a pause for me so he's like seeing all this stuff like the mules are going away and then darl is the only thing that's kind of remains um in control or mm -hmm. like stagnant in this situation so he kind of anchors back to darl i love that i love noticing the capitalization because there is one instance no two instances where it's not capitalized but then by the end it is capitalized right so it's this idea he says darl and this is one of the times when it was capitalized darl was strong and steady based on what everybody else in the novel talks about with darl I think Vardaman might be the only one to see him this way. Um, everybody else seems to be like, that That kid is flighty, uh, Tolk calls him queer. Um, people, they say people talk about him. Um, they say like, I think Ant says, I get why people talk about this this guy, as though it's not Ant's son. <laughs> He's like, just like, I get why people in the town talk about him. Daryl laughs at inappropriate times. Like, he seems to be somebody who is not steady. He seems to be somebody who is like, um, 
unpredictable, right? And yet here's Vardaman saying Darl was strong and steady and he held her even though she was going to fight against it. He was going to keep her here and this makes things all right. So what does that tell us about Vardaman's relationship to his family and what his concerns are there? He's, he's got a youngest child added. Anyone here the youngest child of a bigger family? Okay, so my brother is this way. Tell me if this is true for you. My brother always wants us to get together. Like he's always like, so he was the last one at home for like three years, right? And he always was like, let's have Sunday dinners with everybody. And if one person couldn't come, he was like really sad and would guilt trip us about it. Like, ah, like you gotta come, come to the family dinner, right? Like it's like my lip, it's my younger brother who um, seems to have the most stake in all of us being in the same room at the same time. Is that fair to say for you? Or no? Um, well, like my family, like we we struggle a bit, right? Mm -hmm. And so, like, we don't get along sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, like, I just want everyone to get along. Yeah. And like, it feels as like the youngest to be like and being left behind. And when everyone leaves the house, then I'm left behind. Yeah. And then when my brothers, I actually yelled at my brothers in the beginning because <laughs> they were. Uh -huh. We were all gathering at the table and they were on the phones and I was just I just got like unreasonably angry because like this is the one time we gather and then they like wanted to like be on the phone and not yeah. there, even though they're like all over me. Yeah. So yeah. So you're just like, no, this is the time that we can bond as a family. And they're like, I value my independence more than this kind of community. I think what my brother feels too is like, I got the chance to have that family community all growing up, right? I'm the oldest of five. So it was like, I was in a family and my brother feels like he's not totally in a family family because he had so long when I mean he he was 11 when I was no he was whew, he was really young when I was not living there anymore like seven years old when I wasn't living there anymore so it's like he missed out on that family idea you know I think Vardaman has a little bit of that where he grasps on to family so much like when Darl is telling him about his existential crisis and Vardaman's just like oh yeah I'm totally with you like I get it you know I don't know that he fully does I think that I mean I do see I do see echoes of their thinking, so maybe, but it does seem like Vardaman is a, a, the type that just wants to keep people calm and keep people um, together and, and kind of at peace together. And no one else in the family seems concerned with that, which makes Vardaman kind of a tragic figure to me. Yeah, Ali Rose. Um, I think that, like, Vardaman is not the one who's like childish, childish from, like, a young person. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah, so that his way then of dealing with the grief by kind of turning his mom into a fish and understanding it as fish and not fish and, and that you can be components of something and a single whole thing at the same time, that seems more mature than the way his siblings are all trying to deal with it, with this sense of control. I, I, think, I think that's true, yeah. Should we do Cash's section, last section? Okay, Cash, I've got some, some modern music here. Ru Takamitsu. <laughs> No grammarly. Come on. There we go. Okay, here's here's cash.
Okay. Cassius section is much shorter, so it makes sense to, for this shorter piece, this minimalism piece, right? So what are Cash's main concerns? We've been talking so much about these characters wanting to be in control. How does Cash create this sense of control for himself? Yeah, Brooklyn. He, um, especially like this part of his section, I feel like maybe his emotions are like kind of all over when he's trying to um, bring them in, make sense of them by putting them into like clear, concise thoughts. Mm -hmm. And um, it kind of reminds me of like what, what I do sometimes, like if I'm overwhelmed, I have to just like, I say, okay, and in my head, like I specifically make a list. Yeah. Like he's thinking very deliberately. Yes, I like that word deliberately here too. And I like that he expects other people to take his deliberateness to heart and yet they don't seem to. And I can, you can tell in this that he's angry because of the way that he uh, stops <laughs> the dashes at the end, which is just like, I am, I'm not even gonna finish, I can't even go there, right? Like backing out of it. Um, he's really interested, he, he's very um, concerned with this idea of balance and something being off balance, which makes his broken leg quite ironic. Um, he says, this thing is off kilter, and so it is going to fail, right? And the way that we can demonstrate control is to make sure that it's perfect and to make sure that it's balanced. And yet here he has broken his leg. They are encasing it in cement. So uh, spoiler alert, that leg is never gonna heal, right? Right. Um, so he's now created the situation, I mean, they've created the situation for him where he's going to be off balancing, off kilter for the rest of his life. So this idea that like, um, he t attempts to control the physical world by understanding its properties, by understanding the physics of it and the architecture of it and all of that. Um, it, because there are things that are out of his control, like the natural world, he's never going to be able to achieve that, that control or balance that he so desires, you know? Um, okay. So I think that might be, just to put it like really plainly, I think that might be Faulkner's way of telling us like this sense of control, this way that he's controlling his environment is ineffectual. Okay, I want to do one more thing. You've got some space at the bottom of this. Do we have time? We do have time. Okay, I'm just going to read you one of the prompts that they gave one year for the AP literature essay. Um, I got some, I read your, your um, reflections on the King Lear essay, and a lot of people were like, I just don't know even how to answer this thing, right? Like, I don't know how to approach this style of essay. So for the next two class periods, we're going to be working a little bit on that. So. 2009, the prompt they gave people said, a symbol is an object, action, or event that represents something or that creates a range of associations beyond itself. So it gives you a little definition of what a symbol is. In literary works, a symbol can express an idea, clarify meaning, or enlarge literal meaning. Select a novel or play, and focusing on one symbol, write an essay analyzing how that symbol functions in the work and what it reveals about the characters or themes of the work as a whole. Do not merely summarize the plot. They always say that at the end, don't just summarize the plot. So basically they're saying, choose a book with a symbol and tell me what that symbol means and how it builds a, builds a theme. That's kind of if you were to put that in plain English. I'm saying that the river is a symbol here. There's a, there's a symbol in this river and how everybody interacts with the river. So what I want you to do right now is write a thesis statement that answers that prompt. You're gonna to have to mention the symbol of the river, and then you're going to have to say, what is the theme that this symbol is contributing to? When we think about theme in a literary work like this, again, we're thinking about like some truth about human nature. What kind of truth about human nature does this river reveal to us? Does that make sense for the thesis? Okay, write the thesis in that blank spot on the blue page, and then we will we'll be done. Hopefully, I don't know, we have to write thesis like super fast here. Maybe we can return to it next time. So you at home, you need to fill out that worksheet then, and then you need to write a thesis at the bottom of it, and you will submit that to this Canvas page. All right, see you later.